Well, I've never had the pleasure of opening a refreshing waters renewal, and I have intentionally prepared this message to do just that. You know, there's, there's many different directions a preacher can go with a topic and even with a text, but I, I truly do want to introduce our theme this year with this message. Our theme is the centrality of the gospel. And these renewals have always been about the centrality of the gospel. That has always been implicit, but this year it is explicit. And for most of us, for many of us, I think we probably have taken this for granted. Well, of course the gospel is central. But did you know that by no means is that the collective opinion of the modern church? Most Christians today, most churches, most denominations and movements believe that the gospel is just the basics of the faith. The gospel is just an introduction to Christianity. Perhaps the gospel is something for new Christians who need to grow up, and certainly the gospel is for unbelievers who need to come in. Surely the gospel is just the milk, not the meat of the word. So once you become a Christian, you get the basics down. Jesus died for my sins. Yes, I understand that. Now let's move on to the real stuff, right? Let's move on to something more profound. Let's study theology. Let's learn how to live a, a moral life. Let's learn how to be good church members. And so most people would say that the gospel is just the introduction. It's just the ABCs. It's just spiritual kindergarten. But when you begin to read the New Testament, and you begin to read the epistles, especially Paul's epistles, like the letter to the Colossians, you begin to see that the gospel is not treated as an introduction at all, it is the very heart, the very center of Christianity. The gospel is the faith. It's not an introduction to the faith. It is the faith. This is Christianity that we're talking about. Not an introduction to Christianity. This is it. In the book of Colossians, Paul is dealing with the very heart the very center of the faith, something that Christians are to never forsake. We're always to keep coming back to this, this center, the gospel of Jesus. In fact, the book of Colossians was written because these early believers were leaving the gospel for something else they thought they needed when everything they really needed they already had in the gospel. The gospel is central to everything in the Christian life, from the beginning of our faith to the very end of this life and our entrance into eternity. The problem is, I think, is that a lot of people come to the Bible, they come to study the Bible, to study some topic in which they are personally interested, usually something that concerns their earthly life, something like money or marriage, if you go to a Christian bookstore, you see, you see this all over the Christian bookstores, all these various topics that people are interested in, and they go to the Bible to find out something about how to live their life or something that is useful, something that's practical to them that they would call practical. But the gospel is not primarily concerned with our lives in this world and helping us to be successful or happy here and now. The gospel is really about something else that is coming in the future that is beyond life in this present world for which we all must be prepared. Amen. Now my topic is the hope of the gospel. Hope is anticipation. Hope is, is the expectation of something good coming in the future and the gospel brings and gives hope and this hope in the gospel is not wishful thinking it's not a mere desire something that we want but we may or may not get 
the hope of the gospel is based on the promises of God and what has already been done in Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is declaring. The gospel is declaring something that God himself has promised to do and something, in fact, that has already been done through his son, Christ Jesus. So I'm going to affirm in this message that the gospel alone, only the gospel, can give us hope. Amen. The gospel gives us hope for the forgiveness of our sins. It gives us hope for becoming new creations in Christ. Amen. And it gives us hope, finally, for eternal glory from God. Amen. So first of all, we must begin with this, that the gospel gives us hope for the forgiveness of our sins. And this is the, the perfect place for us to begin. It's probably the first thing we hear when we hear the gospel. It's the thing that, that sounds so good to us, that moves us toward Christ, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. You know, there is no good news. There, gospel means good news. There is no gospel. There is no good news if God were only angry with us, if he were only waiting to strike us down and send us to eternal hell, if that was true, there would be no gospel. There would be no hope for any of us. But if God in Christ is willing to receive me and to forgive me of all my sins, then suddenly I have hope. If there is no forgiveness of sins, then there is no hope at all and we don't go any further. I'm aware of the fact that we live in an age where the knowledge of sin is almost gone and forgotten, even in the church. People today do not think of themselves as sinners in the hands of a God who hates evil and can judge them. People today think of God as being too loving, too kind to do anything about sin. <coughs> Surely God loves us anyway. That's the opinion of most people. God loves us anyway, no matter what we do, in spite of all of our faults and flaws, which most people don't think is that bad anyway. Of course God loves me. I'm a pretty decent person after all. Well, who wouldn't love me? That's really the popular theology today. But the scripture takes sin, all sin, very seriously. And this is an important thing to realize about the biblical doctrine of sin. Sin is more than just the things that we do to break God's commandments. Sin is more than just the things that we do that are wrong. Sin is a state that we are in. It's a condition, not just what we do. The scripture says we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are dead to God. The problem with sin and with sinners is not just the things that they do, it's the fact that sinners act as if God does not exist. They are dead in sin to God. We are slaves to sin, the Bible says. Slaves to sin. Oh, I know we think we're doing what we want to do, but that kind of selfish living is actually the greatest kind of slavery. We're slaves to our own passions. We ought to serve God and do what he wants, but instead we're serving our own selfish desires. We're slaves to sin. Not only are we slaves to our own sinful desires, the Bible says we are also under the influence of Satan and his kingdom of darkness that rules this present evil world. No one can escape this. We are actually outside of Christ. We were serving the devil and doing his will, even though we thought we were doing what we wanted to do. You see, no one, no one is really just free to do whatever he wants to do. We're slaves to sin and to Satan. Sin also alienates us from God. That means that sin makes us God's enemies. Sinners are opposed to God. They are at war with God. They are hostile to God. Sinners are rebels by nature. 
And because we are in this state, we deserve the opposition of a holy God. And that's what wrath is. The wrath of God is God's holy opposition to everything that is opposed to his own nature. God must be opposed to sin, otherwise God himself would be on the side of evil. And that's impossible for him to do. God ought to even punish sinners for their rebellion. And anyone who is offended by that statement ought to consider the fact that this is exactly what we do with people who rebel against our own human laws. If we think it is right for men to punish other men for breaking human laws, then why would anyone be offended at the idea that a righteous God would punish sinners for breaking and rebelling against his own law? Why is it a serious matter to rebel against the laws of men, but rebelling against the law of God, well, that's no big deal. Doesn't make any sense. And so at some point, at some point, we all have to come to this place, to this conclusion that we are sinners and that we deserve the wrath of God. And when we come to that point, now we are ready to hear the gospel. Now we are ready to hear some good news. And there is good news for sinners who are under the wrath of God. Rather than punishing every sinner as he or she deserves, God has instead made a way to forgive sinners and to do that in a way that does not compromise his own just and righteous character. Amen. You see, God, God needs a reason, a right reason to forgive sinners. God can't just sweep it under the rug. God can't just pretend like it never happened. God simply can't ignore our sin. That would mean compromising his own integrity. And so in the New Testament, you come across these various words that tell us what Jesus did when he died on the cross. Words like this, redemption, reconciliation, salvation, atonement, sacrifice, propitiation. I wish I had time to unpack all of those various words, but just to sum them all up, all of those words about what Jesus did when he died on the cross point to the fact that there was a problem between God and man that had to be properly and righteously rectified and resolved before men could be received back into divine fellowship and favor. Something had to be done a price had to be paid, a work had to be accomplished, a transaction had to be completed so that everything was made right. And then God was free to receive us back Amen. to himself. And this transaction, this price was costly. It was painful as forgiveness always is, if you have ever had to forgive someone of something, you know that forgiveness is costly and painful. Amen. And so the gospel is telling us some good news. The price has been paid, but not by you, not by us. God himself has absorbed the cost of our forgiveness in the cross of Christ. We're not talking here about a petty, arbitrary, pagan deity who must be appeased through blood sacrifice. We're talking about, in the gospel, a God who is perfectly righteous, but also merciful to mankind. He does not simply want to destroy sinners. He wants to be merciful. And so the cross of Christ allows God to be on one hand righteous and on the other hand merciful to sinners without compromising anything in his divine nature. That's the gospel. See, the gospel is not just that God loves you just the way you are. That's not the gospel. There's something more to it than that. 
The sacrificial death of Christ on the cross shows us that God is impeccably holy and righteous, that our sin against him was a serious matter, but that he also loves us and would not let us go. And so he has provided a way to forgive sinners of their sin. So we have this hope, brethren. We have this hope in the gospel that any sinner can be forgiven of any sin because all sins have been paid for and covered by the death of Jesus Christ. And that's perhaps the best part of the gospel. And we should never lose that or lose our gratitude for the forgiveness of our sins. It all starts with this. It all starts here. Now, there are some people who think today, and this is not a new doctrine, but it seems to be gaining popularity, that the forgiveness of sins is simply given unconditionally and automatically to each and every person, and that that means everybody in the end is going to be saved. This is called the doctrine of universalism, and it is gaining popularity in the church. Some, some would even point to the Apostle Paul and to the book of Colossians to support this doctrine. I mean, didn't Paul say this in Colossians 1, 19 and 20? For in him, that's Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, that's Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So there you go, there it is, they say. All things have been reconciled. Some have even speculated that the devil himself will eventually be reconciled to God. But this doctrine of universalism is easily refuted by Paul's own words right here in, in our text. You are reconciled, Paul says, if, if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So clearly not every person is reconciled, but only those who cling by faith to the hope of the gospel. Yes, forgiveness of sins is possible because of the death of Christ, but this forgiveness must be received. It must be appropriated through faith in Christ. There is a place of forgiveness and peace and safety with God, but it is only in Christ. So stay in that place. This is what Paul is saying to the Colossians. This is what Paul is saying to us today. Stay in that place of peace and safety. Don't stray away from it. Don't wander from the gospel that has brought you into this reconciliation with God. Don't wander away from it to something else. There is no peace and safety apart from or outside of the gospel of Christ that has saved you. This forgiveness of sins was full and complete in Christ. You don't need anything else. That's what Paul is saying in the book of Colossians. They, you see, they thought they, they needed something else. The gospel is not sufficient. Paul's saying, no, th this is all you need. Your sins have been forgiven in Christ through the gospel, through your faith in the gospel. You don't need anything else. However, this forgiveness of sins is just the beginning of everything God has for us in the gospel. And so we have to move ahead to this second point. The gospel also gives us hope of becoming new creations in Christ. It is misleading, you see, to teach that the gospel is just a way of getting off the hook for our sins. But many people preach just that message, that Christians are forgiven, but they're still basically sinners just like everyone else. This is commonly taught in the church today. Well, what kind of salvation is that? What kind of salvation would leave you unchanged and basically still a slave to sin and to Satan? That's no salvation at all. That's not gospel at all. The gospel says that we can not only be legally forgiven of our sins, but also experientially and personally delivered from sin's dominion and made into an entirely new kind of person in Christ. Amen. This is another aspect of the gospel. Amen. 
And so now we've moved from that aspect of the gospel that is called justification to that aspect of the gospel that is called regeneration. Unfortunately, the regeneration that's promised in the gospel is usually left out of most gospel presentations today, leaving the impression that a person can be saved and still be the same old man. But the objective of the gospel is to create new creatures, an entirely new race of men, a new kind of person. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, when Paul said that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation, he meant that the gospel has the power to make men new, to regenerate them. Jesus himself taught the necessity of the new birth and regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless we are made new or born again, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot even enter the kingdom of God. Some priest that the good news is just that God loves us the way we are and accepts us no matter what. And while it is true that Christ died for us even while we were yet sinners, the message of the gospel is that we cannot remain as we are and enter the kingdom of God. But the good news is is that God has provided a way for us to be made new. One of the great misunderstandings of salvation is that God is simply reforming sinners in order to save them. In other words, to be saved, all you have to do is clean up your act a little, add some religious routines, get some new habits, and you are ready for heaven. And all of that is based on the assumption that we're really not in that bad of a condition in the first place. We're perhaps like a, an old antique silver tea, tea set that just needs to be polished up a bit and is still usable and valuable. Many people assume that about men and women. And so today we've devised all kinds of ways to reform people, to improve their lives, and their character. Some of these reform efforts are secular, like psychology and psychiatric care, and some are religious. I have no doubt, I do believe that people really do want to change. People do really want to do better, most people. Most people are not satisfied with themselves and their lives, and they want to improve in some way. But there are two significant problems with this kind of thinking as it relates to God. First of all, the gospel does not teach reformation, it proclaims transformation. Amen. The gospel is not about cleaning up your act, it's about becoming something completely different. The message of the gospel is not that we must reform, but that we must be completely transformed into something else, just like a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and emerges a completely different kind of creature. Nothing associated with Adam is acceptable to God. The old man is corrupt and weak and incompatible with the heavenly order of things. And so, brethren, you can come as you are, but you can't stay what you were and enter the kingdom of God. Secondly, the second problem with this thinking about salvation just as reformation is that all of our reformation efforts fail to go deep enough. We usually focus only on what is, can be seen, on the externals, or on behavior. But it is the nature, the heart of man, that is corrupt and that needs to be changed. And that is precisely the part that we can't change ourselves, but we desperately need to be changed. Our only hope, our only hope, is a kind of radical spiritual surgery that only God himself can perform within us. This radical surgery that I'm talking about, Paul talks about in the book of Colossians. In chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul uses the imagery of old covenant circumcision. The old man of sin was cut away 
and something new has been created in the believer. And this was a spiritual operation or a work that God himself had to perform in us. It is not and could not be done by the hands of men. The good news is that it can be done and that it has in fact been done in every believer in Christ. This new creation, this new man is not describing some kind of moral goal that we are to aspire to. The new man is a living reality in every believer in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. The new man, to be specific, the new man is Christ, just as the old man was Adam. All of us who are human have borne the likeness of our father, Adam, meaning that we are all sinners who are subject to death. But just as we were once in Adam or in solidarity with Adam, we are now in Christ and are made to be like him. You see, there are two humanities. There's Adam's line and Christ's line. Adam's line has been written off, so to speak. Christ is the first of a whole new humanity or an entirely new creation. And so this life of Christ has gotten into us sort of like a good kind of infection as C.S. Lewis called it. The very life of Christ which is divine life, is at work in every believer. We have been raised to life. We have been made alive in Christ. And this is not some kind of elaborate metaphor or charade. You really have been made new. There is a new life in you that is growing and being renewed day by day. This new man is created in the likeness of Christ himself. And so you can see, brethren, that the gospel is radically different from moral reform. We are talking about an essential change, a change of nature. And this, brethren, is where the gospel becomes practical. By practical, I mean something that is put into practice. The gospel is not just an idea or something completely spiritual and unseen. The gospel makes a claim on every aspect of our lives, including what we do with our physical bodies. And so Paul tells the Colossians that Christians must put off the old man. This is in chapter 3 of Colossians, verses 5 to 10. He says, put off the old man and put on the new man. Now, Paul is not speaking of something mystical here. He's speaking of something practical. He's speaking about what we do. There are things the old man did that must be stopped or put to death or denied expression. There are things, on the other hand, that the new man must do and put into practice. Putting on the new man is equivalent to picking up a tool and beginning to use it or putting on a new suit of clothes. You see, the Christian is no longer a helpless slave to sin like the unregenerate man. The Christian can simply put the old man aside, Amen. just like you might lay aside an old dirty garment. Amen. The gospel, you see, is God's complete recovery program, and nothing else is needed in the struggle against sin. The gospel not only offers forgiveness of sins, it is also power, it offers power over sin's dominion and domination. No believer in Christ has to sin. No believer in Christ has to be bullied or dominated by the old man. And this morning, if you are lacking confidence in these things, just remember, if you're struggling with sin, that the old man is not who you are any longer. You are a new creation in Christ. That new man is your new self, your new life. And so it's your job now, it's your right, if you will, to become the new creation that you have been made to be in Christ. Don't settle for anything less than newness of life. 
And so finally, there's one more aspect, one more piece of good news and hope through the gospel. We have the hope for eternal glory from God. I hope you've noticed there's a natural progression in salvation. First, there is the forgiveness of sins or justification where our guilt is removed. Then there is regeneration that helps us overcome the old life of sin, but the process isn't finished there. It isn't finished yet. There's more. There's one more step. The final step in salvation, the hope that we have in the gospel, is for glorification. The forgiveness of sins and becoming a new creation is in order to prepare us for the final stage of salvation. And if we don't make it all the way through to this final stage, it has all been in vain. And let me remind you that there is a danger of not finishing this process if we abandon the gospel of our salvation. In one sense, we are saved, but in another sense, we are not yet saved saved. The process is not finished as long as we remain in this body and in this world. In this world, the saints are a work in process, and this process has a purpose that will be realized in the future. God is preparing us for something that is to come. You have been saved with the future, God's future purpose in mind. We are not saved just for this world, but for something else entirely. As I think I've already mentioned, one of the great follies of our time in the church world is an inordinate focus on this world and this life. Almost all preaching today seems to be in this direction, how God wants to help you to improve your life here and now. And so people are only interested in those biblical topics that touch some aspect of life in the world as I've already mentioned, like money or marriage and family or political issues or careers or how to run a church. It's not that all of those concerns are illegitimate. All of those issues have their place and are addressed in Scripture. But as someone once said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is the gospel. And the main thing about the gospel is getting us ready to be with the Lord forever in the world to come. You see, this world and this life are going to pass away. Either when we die personally and leave the world in the body, or when the Lord himself descends from heaven and the world passes away, whichever comes first, it's all going to go away. So why would God give us a gospel and a salvation that emphasizes the things that are going to pass away? It doesn't make sense. There's got to be more to it than that. And there is more to it than that. You can think of this physical world in this, in this way. The physical world is something like a veil. If you know your Old Testament, you remember that in the tabernacle that Moses built, there was a veil that covered the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God. In the same way, there is a veil, if you will, that separates us mercifully from the full presence of God. That veil is the physical world and our physical mortal bodies. At some time in the future, brethren, we know not the day or the hour, Christ is going to appear. He is going to pierce that veil separating heaven and earth and his glory is going to be revealed. When that happens, it will be the end of the world as we know it and the beginning of something new. The new creation, even a new earth, is going to appear at that time. And then, and then there is going to be a great and final separation or purge. That will take place. Everything and everyone that is not fit or not compatible with this new creation will be permanently removed from it. The last chapters in the Bible in the book of Revelation give us a glimpse of this new world. It is a world permeated by the presence and the glory of God. 
and anything or anyone not reconciled to God will be cast out forever. We have been made new to fit in that new world. The, the very idea that we could go through life in this world while ignoring and avoiding God and then be happy in a world where the main feature and reality is the presence of God, that is a false hope that I'm afraid millions of people entertain. A day is coming when any, everyone who has ever lived will have to appear before the presence of God to be inspected. Amen. And being able to pass that inspection, to actually be a creature that is pleasing to God, to actually even receive praise from God, that is the kind of eternal glory that is being offered to us in the gospel. The only hope that we have of passing that inspection, that divine inspection, is for God himself to make us ready for it. The only work that will pass through the fire of divine judgment is the work that God himself has done. And this work must begin in us now, just as the stones for Solomon's temple were hewn in the quarry before being set in place. This world is a place of preparation where the saints are being prepared and made fit for eternal glory in the world to come. And you might be asking, well, is there any hope for me that I will actually be ready for that? Yes, there's hope in the gospel. Amen. To be specific, Paul says in Colossians that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you today is the hope of glory on that final day. In some sense, brethren, the future is here. The future has already come. We've already seen a glimpse of that eternal glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the future. And if Christ is in us now, then by his grace, we can be made ready for that day. The only people who will pass that inspection on that final day will be those who have in this life been united with Christ. Amen. This union with Christ is so complete that it can be said that the believer has died. We no longer live but Christ is living in us, making us into glorious new creatures that bear his likeness. So on that day, that final day, when God turns his holy gaze toward us, he will see his son in us, and we will be recognized by God as his sons. That's the hope of glory that's offered only in the gospel. Someday, brethren, we are going to be revealed. Just as he is going to be revealed in glory, we are going to be revealed in glory or made known for what we really are and have become in Christ. That's the hope of glory. And only the gospel gives us hope of hearing the very same words that were once pronounced from heaven over Christ himself. He'll look at us and he'll say, these are my beloved sons. With them, I am well pleased. And that is the hope of the gospel.